I'm Barb Trafton, and we're here in Proust's cabin um, with Susan Hallett. And we are here tonight because we gathered with a group of members of the community who are interested in fundraising for the Kids Up Playground at Battle Point Park. And um, this is important because these things only happen with funds that are donated from community members. But what we do at the Parks Foundation is bring community-minded people to these events and places to try to make things happen that wouldn't happen otherwise with the limited budget of the Park District. But we'd like them to learn how to do this well. And so we invited Susan here to educate us all. And I'm Susan Hallett. I'm a fundraising consultant to thousands of organizations all over the, the United States and have been doing it for many, many years with many organizations on Bainbridge itself. And I teach at the university and I've written several books on fundraising and tonight we're getting together with some leaders from the Parks District and uh, people who are excited about this playground project and want to learn how to engage the rest of the community in doing it. So the goal for the fundraising campaign is to raise $500,000 to renovate the beloved Kids Up Playground. And this playground has been a real favorite of the community, and not only just the community, really regionally for the last 17 years, but it's reached the end of its material life. It's largely built of wood and with a lot of wear and tear from years of hard play and sun and rain, it is deteriorating. And the original playground was dreamt up and funded and built by community members and now we're, we've gathered a new generation of parents and families to plan and fund and build a new playground. I'd like us to go around again and just say if we have kids or what is our relationship to that particular park? I have an eight and a 10 year old and we went to preschool across the street and we lived at that park so I'm so excited <laughs> to be a part of turning it also into something that older kids will still want to use as opposed to just, you know, the preschool mm -hmm. kids making it more of a multi-age park. I do remember some friends from Seattle coming over with their young children and we went there and they said, you know that playground that's like Disneyland? <laughs> <laughs> they called it Disneyland because it was so spectacular. So it's also great to be involved now to see it in its second life. And I have two grown daughters who grew up at the playground. We've been here since 1983. Uh, but our family proliferates rapidly, so we now have four grandchildren. <laughs> and uh, two that are in Redmond, two in San Francisco, but they've all come visit this playground when they visit us. So we love it. We moved here five years ago, and I, I, you know, I think I met all of my friends right there on the playground. <laughs> Not just my kids' friends, but my husband's friends and my friends. And it was really a special place, and I don't love seeing that it's deteriorating, but that's why I want to make it a bigger and better um, enjoyable experience for generations to come. We're actually not talking about raising money. We're talking about connecting people to the things that they value, and money will follow. And so tonight is about how to serve gather our heads around on our hearts around what this campaign is going to look like and get some structure around it. But I really want you to understand that it's really about relationships, not about money. So you each have some handouts in front of you. Um, we're going to be filling them in as we go. Uh, we're going to have, I'm going to be delivering some content, the interactive, but content until about six when Trish is going to go get us some supper. So the first thing on the handout says, what is our goal? So can anyone tell us what the dollar goal is? $500,000. 500000 So once you fill that in, anybody need a pen? Yeah. You really need to fundraise if you want anything, if you want the, some of it to be purchased for next year. The Park District is saying we'd have to raise about two hundred and fifty by by Christmas time. All right. So I want you to write in the next line, this is not about money, it's about relationships. And the next thing I want you to write down is that the only way we're going to reach our goal is by drawing a vivid image of a need or a problem that the donor can solve. So again, the only way that we're going to reach our goal is if we draw vivid images of a need or a problem that the donor can solve. We know this from millions of dollars worth of research that's been repeated over and over again, that that's, that people don't give if nothing's broken. So we have to draw an image for people that something's broken and needs attention and make them the hero 
by solving that problem. And what's going to trigger those gifts is emotion. So that's the next line on the handouts. It's emotion, not logic. So explaining things to people isn't going to raise us money, but evoking emotions will. And we know from decades of research what emotions work. So I'm not going to tell you all of them. I'm going to tell you the ones that are best for this project. The first one is fear. So can you imagine how you would use fear in talking about this context? There won't be a great playground for your kids to play on. Okay. The current structure is unsafe. Unsafe. That's a good fear one. They might have to close it. Yeah, but they might have to close it. What will happen if we don't do this? That's the fear angle. The next one is greed or self-interest. So how would you address that one? So the whole thing about greed or self-interest is if you want this iconic gathering place in your community. The third one is guilt. I don't actually like to use guilt, but it might work to a certain extent in this campaign by saying to people, if your family had memorable experiences here, then why don't you make that happen for the next generation? So you used it, someone built it for your family, now help us build it for the next generation. And the fourth one is exclusivity. And the way we use exclusivity in a context like this is to say, not everybody gets what this place means, but you get it. You're one of the insiders who understands what this place means to all of us. Do those feel genuine? Because it need, it needs, when you say these things to other people, it needs to feel like you really believe it in your heart. So let's work through some of those things if, there's, if you're struggling with how to use them. Let's talk about it. Maybe explain a little more what you mean by exclusivity. So not everybody on the island uses BattlePoint. And, so, and they don't think it's theirs. And so one of the things we want to focus on is people who get it, who know where it is, who use it, and who understand that the playground is a vital part of the entire park. And so when you're speaking to people like that, you make them feel like insiders, and you say, you've used it, you've seen what happens there, you get it. And it makes them feel like but they're part of a special club. The cool kids. Great, mm -hmm. right. thank you. There are some other emotions, but they don't raise nearly as much money as these. Okay. So this has been tested over and over and over and over again. The other ones are love, compassion, duty, and faith, um, and hope or something, but they don't raise nearly as much. So if you send out two appeals on the same issue to the same sort of research cell, these would pull way more. So, and it tells us something really intriguing about people, that our desire to give is a really base emotion. We make financial decisions out of our lizard brain. And that's why I said we're going to use emotions, not logic. Because when you explain things to people and you try to tell them rational reasons why they should invest, it's not going to raise any money. When you evoke emotions, people will give you lots of money. So is part of the trick of this then to keep these concepts, these words, in our minds, <laughs> but the trick is for you to help us convey that without using those words? Mm -hmm. Right. So that's really what we're here. Yeah, you don't go, danger, danger. Right. <laughs> so it's authentic and sincere, but mm -hmm. with an understanding of some of these lizard emotions. Right. So if you want to watch these in action, look at political fundraising this fall, because they've got it down. They've got it down. And you don't want to be as maybe in your face as the political fundraisers are, but you understand what I'm saying? Like raising kids, too. I mean, really, like if I want to get my kids to do something, you know, you're going, I'm going to take your phone away. Yeah, but I actually use those words. Yeah. It makes sense that's how you get results. Right. Guilting them right. and you know, making them feel special. Yeah. People, whenever I do this content, people always push back because they don't want to believe it's true. In fact, one guy in one of my classes actually wrote a whole poem about it, calling these emotions a monster. He said, I don't want this monster to be real, but... So there's another thing on your handouts here that I want you to fill out, and these might feel a little bit better. Uh, the first one is that people want to feel appreciated. They want to feel appreciated, seen, heard, known, valued by the organization. And that could mean, first, what they've done on our behalf before. Like maybe they've given money, maybe they've given in-kind gifts of goods or services, maybe they helped build the park, maybe they've used it a lot. Maybe they've advocated for park district levies or something. They want to feel like you know who they are in relationship to this park, this playground. And so the more you can shine a light on them and say you understand their values, you understand what they've done on behalf of this before, 
that's going to make people love you more. And so you don't want to send out a shotgun message that goes to everybody. You're going to want to tailor it to people and call out what their emotional relationship is to you and what they've done on behalf of the park or the playground before. So that's the first one. People want to feel appreciated and we should start all of our communiques to all of our donor prospects with gratitude for what they believe in, what they stand for, what they've done in the community, whether it's for the park or not. So they feel seen. The second thing is that people want to feel like whatever they've done on our behalf is actually going to make a difference or move a dial. So people want to make a difference with their giving. And so the way that we're going to attack that or uh, address that is to draw really vivid images for them of what their gift could do. And it can't be about a lot of things. It can't be like thousands of children are going to play on this playground. It has to be about one child who felt like he belonged when the other kids in included him on that playground. Or one child who had some awakening about how their body worked when they were climbing on it or something like that. So the more we can tell stories about how, or now if you're going to make this one accessible, this park or playground is going to be accessible, you can say kids who haven't been able to participate are now going to be able to participate. So the more you can draw, a, draw um, tell a story about one child having an improved experience, because of the playground, the better off you're going to be. So when we talk about broad numbers of people, it doesn't raise as much money as one. So question, um, is it worth it at this point in the fundraising campaign to solicit stories at the playground about those experiences, whether they sign up or here's the link to or how to contact mm -hmm. whatever? Yeah, and, and then, do that right away so you can reload and into what you're going to be doing. Yes, that would be ideal. And the woman who's helping me with the social media strategy said that the more you can have really great pictures and really great quotes from current users, the better, the better off you're going to be. So, um, and you could mess with people's quotes. There's kind of a rule in fundraising that you don't need to take what people say word for word. You make it compelling to the reader or the listener. And um, then you ask the person who said it if that's okay with them. Because <laughs> usually people will tell you something really earnest and genuine, but it may not be as polished as you need for your documents. So just take their sentiment and make it Good enough to go public. They might like sounding better. <laughs> yeah. it's a compliment, huh? Yes, and they could say something even more compelling than the way we've been doing it too. So sometimes we get so admired in the project that we use the same words over and over again. And somebody else says something that's an epiphany for us. So the more we can gather those stories and quotes, the better. That's really good. People who are in sales say features. Let's see, how does this go? Benefits sell, features tell. So the feature is like, there's gonna be a cool climber. And the benefit is kids are gonna use gross motor, um, you know, strengthen their gross motor skills. And um, a lot of it is about connection. I think you guys should use the word connection a lot when you're talking about this, because did you hear what she said about what the park meant to her? She met her friends there and her husband's yeah, friends. Great, and yeah. so the whole idea of this being a gathering place for not just children, but the families is a powerful image. And I think you should use that. But it's always the impact on the end user, not the thing that we're buying. So people's money will go to buy a climber or whatever, but that's not what they're paying for. They're paying for the experience that the kid is going to have. So the second one was that people want to feel like they're making a difference and we need to be able to tell stories about what difference happens, what differences happen, how we're moving a dial. And I think that you have a lot of opportunities with this because you can talk about how kids are sedentary these days and we need to get them out and moving. Kids aren't connected to nature and this is going to get them in nature and so on. So there are a lot more things than just playing for playing's sake, which is good enough on its own, but you've got more arguments there that could involve kids doing more non-screen time and stuff like that. So the third one that I want you to write down here is that people want to feel a sense of belonging or a sense of connection to something bigger than themselves. It's one of the most fundamental needs of human beings is to feel connected. And so I think this playground offers all three of those things in spades. That it offers you lots of opportunity to talk to people about how important they are how important they've been to the island, to the, to the park, um, to kids, whatever. Whether they've had anything to do with this playground or not, you can just say, we've watched you behave in the community and we think you're like this, and reflect that back. So that's the feel appreciated, make a difference as the stories, and sense of belonging is about using words like family, the Bainbridge family, the Battle Point family, the Kids Up family, talking about belonging, connect, connection, 
tribe. These are our people. Those kinds of words really respond. People respond to them well. I love the idea that they come up with, which is the, sort of the subtitle, which is the next generation of play. Too. It's almost like, you know, number of us that were the first generation of the playground, we've grown up, we've moved on, and, and now a lot more people have moved to the island. And, you know, I love the idea of all of you coming together as a generation, as a, fam as a group of families of young kids. It's like, We're already getting your generation. So I'm going to give you guys a minute to, we've, I've dumped a lot on you already, and I'm going to give you a minute just uh, to talk with whoever's sitting near you and this kind of process what you just heard, see how it applies to your life, to this project. Who has a key takeaway from the last few minutes that they want to share? Like, how does this, how does this content apply to your world? Well, one thing, I'm, as we're talking about this, I'm fascinated by how you presented this and the weaving that goes on narratively through all of this, um, and that part of what, in anything, whether it's the playground or anything else, getting people engaged with it is telling them a story about themselves, which mm -hmm. they may not necessarily know or have articulated very clearly. So if you can pull those, I mean, some people are good at that, some people aren't. But be able to pull the strands, and it means that we have to do some thinking about those people and what it is that they have done. Not only that, but what they can do. But it's wonderful to think about how you can help people understand themselves and then generate an image of themselves that carries through something like this. Mm -hmm. So they are connecting. But that's kind of the gift of fundraising. That's really the gift of getting involved with projects that people that didn't really realize at the time. And it's such a gift to give back that way. That's why I said it's not about money. It's about relationships and listening to people. And the uh, handbook that you all got today from Barb mm -hmm. has a lot of details in it about how to do this. Like there's quite a lot on how to ask people to open in questions that get them talking about their own story because they may not realize it until you ask those questions and they're going to sell themselves on how much they love what it stands for without you having to sell it. Because you're talking about play and creativity mm -hmm. and that's such a universal um, thing that spans, you know, all ages and, and Sarah and I were just talking about our other fundraising project which is, is to raise money for restoration and stewardship. A little bit of a harder sell. Greed really works for that. <laughs> One of the things that we, I mean, we've been so focused on the logic of it, what's our budget, what's the timeline, mm -hmm. that what we've already got is the emotion, the emotion's there, and we hadn't really thought too much about banking on that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we can move forward with the emotion aspect of it, even if the logic part isn't, isn't fully uh, resolved. Yes. That's, right. That was pretty eye-opening. Right. Isn't that good? Yeah. And the, the cool thing is that you'll want to give people logical reasons because there's a line in this field that says um, people buy emotionally and justify rationally. Uh -huh. And so they'll, if they're going to be, especially some of your major donors, if they're giving, if there are lots of zeros on their check, yeah. they have to have a logical rationale to justify that gift. Yeah. And so, but the gift is actually going to be made based on the emotion. And then they just, you need to backfill with the logical rationale. Yeah. So once they've committed, like they've jumped in because they've you know, gotten the emotional mm -hmm. connection, then the rational backfilling starts. It's just like I make the analogy between um, like what people drive and who they sleep with. So when you bought whatever it is that you drive or ride, you told all the people around you that it was because it got good mileage or you got a good deal on it or something, but you really liked how it looked and smelled and felt, right? Am I right? And then the, when you think about who you're sleeping with, you told your parents that they were really kind and well-educated and came from a nice family or something. But I felt the same way about my wife. <laughs> you liked how she looked and felt and smelled. Right, good, good. <laughs> I'll have to switch my analogies. <laughs> Wait, then if you say, I got good mileage, <laughs> how does that work? <laughs> Anything else come up for people? All right, then let's move on to a little more logical part, which is uh, who the sources are. So the next thing on your handout should say sources. And the kind, who do you think it's going to be? Where do you think this money is going to come from? In broad brush terms, like 
ca big category. So I started with the government <laughs> because there may be some government funding that gets put into this. And then the next thing that I put down is foundations. And we don't know for sure if there are going to be foundations that are interested in this, but Barb has a list of potential ones in the office and um, would work with you to write proposals if there are some suitable ones. The next thing in my list is businesses. I know that there aren't any corporations per se on the island, but there are businesses. And I'm going to discourage you from spending a lot of time and energy on them because historically, the business community has, attributed, has contributed about 4% of all charitable giving every year. It's 4% or less of all charitable giving. So, yeah, well, it doesn't matter where you are. Like, you can slice it as small as you want, as small as the island, and then you could go up to King County, to the state, to the country, to the world. It's all the same. It's never changed. If it's changed, it's gone down. And so, um, and I was telling Barb that when I first got invited onto the board of my Chamber of Commerce in my neighborhood, they said, we're really glad you're on the board now. We, the first thing we'd like you to do is give us a, a presentation on how to say no to all the people who ask us for money every day. Yeah. <laughs> so um, they said that what people didn't understand are this, it's the same person with two checkbooks, one that has the business name and one that has the family name on it. Yeah. And they really don't have that much giving capacity and that they're asked by everyone who patronizes them. And everyone who patronizes them asks, asks, acts like they're entitled to a gift from them. So um, in fact, I was on an auction committee one time with one of the children from the Ben Bridge family. And he said that they get asked for auction items an average of 27 times per day per store. Whoa, seriously? So imagine what it's like on, on an island where there's like this many businesses and this many people. Yeah, so I, I would say don't put a lot of stake in the business community, but there will be some who are happy to help you. But naming rights, does that change this at all? If those are opportunities for businesses mm -hmm. to have a, something, a plaque or something on the playground or it, Well, and I put a bunch in the handbook about that. I think that the distinction is if they have shared mission, shared values, shared goals with you, shared constituency, then maybe so. So like if there's somebody on the island who sells sportswear, outdoor equipment. Yeah, uh, or who promotes cycling or hiking or riding horses or something, then they may be a good candidate because it's all part of the park and the playground. But, or if it's um, like kids athletic wear or something like that, then maybe. But apart from that, I think it's, it's not a good, way, a good use of your time. So we said government, foundations, and businesses. Then here's where all the money's going to come from, major donors who are individuals. And in the handbook that we created, I call them lead donors because you're going to need to approach them early in the process. And they're going to take more time than pretty much all the other things. And then the last category here for sources is community donors mm -hmm. who are not large donors. So you should have government, foundations, businesses, major donors, and then community donors as your sources. And in that order, Part of the reason why I put the government and foundations and businesses early, even though they may not give you the largest gifts, is that the process that you have to go through with them needs a kickstart, a head start. So they'll take longer to find them and find out what their deadlines are, what their guidelines are, to write proposals, to meet with them if necessary or whatever. So um, that's why I put them at the front end, but you'll get most of your money from individual major donors. How do you identify major individual donors? We'll get there in just a minute. Oh, in fact, we're there right now. So if you'll turn to the next page in your handout, there's a pyramid there. So every organization has a donor pyramid, whether they know it or not. I'm going to ask you to draw 12 lines inside your pyramid. Oops, that's hard. So what usually happens in most organizations is you get a ton of small gifts. So these could be anywhere from a dollar, from like a kid, to let's say $50 or something, and then there will be fewer yet at 50 to 100, and then from 100 to 250 there will be fewer, 250 to 500 and so on. As you go up, you get fewer donors at each level. So let's say 1,000 to 2,500, 25 to 5K, 5K to 10K, and so on, 10 to 25. 50. I must have done this a little bit wrong. But you get the trajectory that we're doing here? 
I think that we, maybe I started with 1 to 25 at the bottom. But the idea is that you'll have one of those and two of those and 5 and 10 and 20 like that. As you go down the pyramid, the numbers get exponentially kind of higher. So in the handbook that you got today, we actually did the numbers. So we know exactly how many gifts you need at each one of these gift levels to get to 500,000. And how much is in already? And then 100,000 matching challenge grant that we haven't received yet. But you'll get it when you raise another 100. Exactly. Okay. So then what you want to do is start, you start at the top and you move down. Because the people down here won't give you the money, their money, until they see that it's a real deal. And they don't understand that until most of this is filled in. So the wisdom, conventional wisdom, is you want to get down in this range right here before you tell the rest of the community that this is a deal. So you're not going to tell everybody at the beginning. You're going to approach these people first, and once you've got most of this filled in, then you start asking the whole, the whole rest of the community. And the handout that we sent you today, handbook, has the exact numbers. And it'll be fun for the team to sit down and start putting prospects next to each one of those and start filling them in. I actually had, I was working with one organization that was full of engineers and they did this. <laughs> so they literally put a cell for every donor and they started filling in names of prospects in every cell. And there's a, a formula that I could get to you if, I, um, if somebody needs it that says how many prospects do you need at each one of those levels to get that number of gifts. So it's totally a formula, very easy to follow. Um, and you'll, one of the first things that this team is going to have to do is figure out who are the people that fit in each slot that we can ask for that much. And our challenge with this playground now is the end of the year and where we find ourselves. And if we wait to get the $2,500 um, gifts, will be missing the opportunity to tap into the end of the year. Yes, but then I, you run the risk that if you ask people at the end of the year just because it's the end of the year, you might get what we call throwaway gifts from them. So they might give you $25 when they could have been worth $2,500 mm -hmm. because you haven't taken the time to build them up. Mm -hmm. So I think I would actually let go of that end of year deadline in your mind and say it's not that important. Because now that tax deductibility has changed, we're not seeing as much uh, emphasis on your end asking. We think. We don't know yet, though, right? Well, there's been a lot of research on how people are estimated to behave, yeah. and they think it's not going to be that big a deal. Also, the people who make the most money at year end are things like homelessness and hunger and you know, social service kinds of organizations. So things that have to do with the outdoors aren't necessarily making more money at year end. Yeah. So the question is, do we need to know what that tax change is? In some case, people ask for how we plan our strategy no. because of it. No. Can you say what it is? No. <laughs> I don't know. You don't know. That what we do is say to people, why don't you check with your tax preparer or something, or your advisor? Especially the people who are your major donor prospects at the top usually have advisors who have been telling them what to do. And the, the research that I've been hearing says that <clears throat> the only people who are going to deduct are the ones making huge gifts. Um, I mean, that are going to have that be a factor in their decision. Oh, let me go back to the pyramid for just a second and say that the top up here is probably going to be government, and then maybe some foundations or businesses, but most of this, most of this is going to be major donors, where individual people are going to give you the, a single gift or a two-year gift for this amount. And then this down here is going to be uh, this, these are all going to be due to face-to-face -face requests where you're actually sitting down across from someone having a cup of coffee and talking to them one-on-one. -on -one. And then these down here will come in in response to letters and phone calls and email. Yeah. So these are proposals. These are face-to-face -face asks. Some of these might be some small gatherings that I'll talk about in a little bit. And then this is all going to be mail and email. Does that make sense to people? That there are going to be different strategies for different tiers on the pyramid. Just a quick question. Do you have from experience a sense of how much time each of these tiers takes or we should expect to put into to get That's that? That's a good up? question. They take different amounts of time for different reasons. These people up here are going to need more cultivation, so you're going to have to spend some time wooing them. And then this down here takes a lot of time just because you're having to deal with thousands of people. So you have to do 
more parties, more mailings, more emails, and stuff like that. So I think I would think I've just done a couple of big capital campaigns in the last year, and they were the major donor part was about the same amount of time as the small donor part, but for really different reasons. All right, then let's go to the Tarnside curve, which says, um, if you look, there are two axes on that page. One is how much people give, which goes bottom left to top left. And the other one is how involved they are in the organization, which goes from bottom left to bottom right. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. So, and it says that the amount that people give goes up the more involved they are. So let's start at the bottom left and it says, when people are only aware of our organizations, they give very little. When they grow interested in our work, they still give very little. Where does it go up? Engagement. Engagement or involvement. What's the word after that? Commitment. Okay, and after that? Ownership. So I think that this time, the space in there around commitment and ownership is where people stop saying you guys and start saying we. And so that's what you're gonna to wanna to watch for as you're cultivating people, you're gonna watch for when do they start saying, talking about it as if it's their gig and not yours. And that means there's gonna be more money. <laughs> and then the last one is taking personal responsibility for the health of this project. So I want you to think about your most joyful or meaningful gift that you've made to a nonprofit in the last couple of years. So I know that you've all had some experience when you just went, oh, that felt so good. You were filling out your charge card number or you're writing a check or transferring stock or making an in-kind gift and you just went, yeah. You're looking forward to doing it again because it felt so good. Do you all have one like that? Might have been time, might have been money, doesn't matter. Will you tell the person sitting next to you what that was? Most joyful or meaningful gift? So did you see what was happening here? A lot of animated conversation, happy, smiling people, you see, talking about giving money away. So um, who can share one quickly, what a joyful gift was, a meaningful gift? Um, we, you know, we usually give mostly to environmental groups or land purchases, you know, here on the island. You know, mm -hmm. So let me just suggest that if you look at where you fit on that Tarnside curve, you are up farther past awareness and interest. I mean, the things I've talked about were things I've just done kind of routinely for years, but they speak to my own personal, professional yes. experience mm -hmm. and interest and, you know, uh, experience on last night. Yeah. Yeah. And it is fear, yeah. like, if you don't support these organizations, who knows what might happen to, you know, certain you know, immigration rights. And, mm -hmm. That's what I want you to feel in here, that, it, that you guys are already all the way up to the top of this Tarnside curve for this project. And so all we have to do is invite people farther up the curve. Yeah. It's not about money. If we invite them to the place where they feel ownership of the project, right. it's going to be their idea to give. How do you pitch to people that they should be more, take more ownership of something that they, I think in some ways, almost take for granted sometimes <laughs> on this island because we have really lovely, and look at this place you know <laughs> it's gorgeous it's wonderful and I, I don't know I, I guess I'm trying to think through again how to sort of pitch that idea that we all need to be owners and stewards of these yeah. places um, that's kind of a baseline I don't know, I'm kind of thinking yeah no I totally get what you're saying and I have a couple of quick responses one is that she used the word should and we're not going to use that word yeah, in this yeah, whole yeah. campaign yeah. <laughs> That people should. No one gives out of that. I mean, some people give out of guilt, but I don't think that it evokes joyful gifts or repeatable yeah. gifts. And so we're not going to say should to anybody. The other thing she used was the word pitch. And I'm not finding fault. I'm just saying that when we do this right, no one feels like they got pitched yes. to. And so one of the things that I suggested in the handbook is ways to engage people physically and emotionally in this park so that they feel like they're part of it, like we're gonna ask for advice, we're gonna have them come out and see the playground, we're gonna have them talk to the designers and get, you know, find out why decisions got made and how they could make them better and blah, blah, blah. So there's gonna be a lot of opportunity, especially among your major donors, for them to feel ownership. And the more you create that sense of ownership, the more they're gonna say we should. Okay. And you're not gonna to have to say you should. But it's a shift for us because we've been taught as fundraisers to sell. But nobody likes that. It feels yucky. And so what we want to do is invite. Invite people to, to join us and 
see if it connects for them. And if it doesn't connect for them, bless them and release them. We're not trying to talk people into something. We're not convincing or persuading or cajoling. We're finding who's inclined toward this work already and pulling them in closer. So let's talk about that for a minute. Mm -hmm. But it, it is opposite of what you were saying with the emotional motivation. So we went to this place of, of, of looking at the, the negatives that drive people to give, mm -hmm. and now we're not going to talk about the negatives, but invite them, invite them along. Right. And while you're hanging out at the playground, they're going to see that it's not safe because the wood's rotting. Yeah. And it's, it becomes an organic outgrowth of engaging them, that they see what the issue is. So I was wondering about that because I feel like we live in the age of liability. How much can we talk about it rotting without because people are still playing on part of it that might be rotten. Where do you draw the line of fear and safety? Yeah. <laughs> and the park district is very concerned about this, actually, yeah. because they yeah. don't they don't want to have anything be in a negative light. Right. right. Um, and yet, well, they, I mean, and yet we have to. There is a need here. There is a need that we're trying to. Address. The, the, not, I mean, we won't let we will not let children play on something that is currently yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, but it's deteriorating. In yeah. But the more they play, the quicker it's going to be. But I think what you say is, hey, everybody, you know, these pieces had to be blocked off or carted away, and that's because we care about your children, or the park district does whatever. And now the, the challenge is now we've got to really renovate this remaining part and add to it so that it's yeah. this next generation, you know. So you play on the yeah. fear and guilt and a little bit. But one of the things that was important to the committee was not getting into this position again in another 15 years. Uh -huh. um, you know, we had a great product that is natural, but it had a lifespan because it's yeah. natural. We were, we're trying to mimic the look of that, but make sure that we're not right back in the same position asking the same people or same families or yes. us when our kids are grown, you know, in another 10 mm -hmm. years, we're hoping we'll have something that has a little bit more longevity to it. So Makes that's sense. been a big part of our internal pitch. Mm -hmm. effort ourselves so we had a lifespan. You know. And I think that's what you should talk about is the life of the material mm -hmm. and now you're planning ahead to the point where before it's a problem you're going to have it solved. Right? And, and to solve it sooner so that the children who are children now can enjoy it. Right. Um, mm -hmm. This great new thing. Mm -hmm. Within, Within our lifespan. Within yeah. our life. In fact one of the things that I put in the handbook about um, when you write letters, you're going to absolutely have to have a deadline in there and say, if we hear from you by date X, you'll get this cool thing, because um, urgency is essential. Probably not with the major donors at the front end, except that you'll want to suggest to them that if they come in early with their gifts, that they're modeling for other people what this looks like, and that they can actually evoke more gifts with their early gifts. I can imagine having a house party in someone's home of those original people mm -hmm. as one of your first major donor efforts. Get them just telling stories about it, record the stories, take pictures of them doing that. Yeah, reminisce. Mm -hmm. I just did that with a board that I was on a while ago. It was the 40th anniversary of this organization's founding. And so um, I brought together all the founding board members and then people who were on the board the first 10 years or so. And all we did was get people back in the room and tell stories about the old days. And then in the last five minutes, we asked them for money. And they, you know, they were just, people were like saying, oh, I should put you in my will too. And we were like, yes, you should. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, maybe there's something we can do with the pickets and those families. Well, that could be um, a social media thing, yeah. couldn't you? Where you could like feature a different picket periodically over time. And, and also have a picket and then get somebody from that era to talk about it. Yeah. And where they are now. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. yeah. I, just to let you know, I last year was given a big box of paper from the park district. And one of them, one of the piles in there was don't the original donors or some of these. No. I don't know if it's complete. And there was a girl who came to me asking for some um, volunteer hours because she in an accident and had to, had to do this, um, you know, community service. Police, community service. So she, I, she did a huge spreadsheet for me oh, of, good. These, of these past donors. So we do have names and old acts. So that's for the donors. And then there's another whole group of people who are the people that actually wielded 
hammers and stuff, and they're, they're gonna remember who the other people were. So even if it isn't codified somewhere, they'll remember who was working on that project with them, and that would be another great house party to just have all the people who did it get together and tell stories and bring pictures, because they probably got pictures and stuff. That's really good. So the, um, let's look back at where we were on Tarnside. So there are lots of suggestions in the handbook about who your best prospects are. And then there are lots of suggestions about how to start cultivating those people. And I want you to be thinking about how to cultivate them over months. And it involves literally asking them to tell their stories, bringing them out to the, play field, the playground, um, asking for advice about something, uh, asking them for a quote about why they think it's important or something like that. So there's a whole ton of suggestions for how to cultivate these people. And I would start thinking about who they are now. I have to point out, our two major donors, one is brand new to the island and the other has no kids. So, wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. No kids, no Their minds are already blown. <laughs> really? Yeah. So the easier, the more connection people have. And then other, and then the other one we're waiting for just moved away. He's moving away. Yeah. Still oh. wants to make a major so that reminds me of something I didn't put in the, the handbook that I want to tell you guys about right now just because it's really fun and the pizza's not here. So I'm going to vamp for a minute and tell you there's um, research that says there are seven types of donors and each one of them needs to hear a different angle that's going to meet their emotional needs. So um, you might want to turn one of these pieces of paper over so you can write this down. One of them is called, and these are in alphabetical order, one's called an altruist. So why would an altruist give to anything? Because they're sure this is the right thing to do because it makes you feel like it's good. Yeah. It's just the right thing to do. And they probably won't benefit from it, but they're just nice, generous people. That's how they roll. The second kind is called a communitarian. So why would a communitarian give to anything? Right. And so we need to be listening for people to find what words did they use when they're identifying their community. Is it the LGBT community? Is it the a particular ethnic community? Is it a part of the island? Is it an age group? Like, what do they call community? So that when you approach them, you can say, a gift to this playground is going to lift the, all the boats in your community and know what you're talking about. The next one is called a devout donor. So where do you think they learned how to give or volunteer? Church. Church or temple or watching their parents be um, generous people. And... Um, so in the Northwest, we don't have a lot of devout donors because <laughs> not that many people here go to church. But people are devoted to something. And so we need to listen to them talk about what they're devoted about. Maybe it's about running. Maybe it's about horses. Maybe it's about um, kids getting exercise. Maybe it's about connections on the island. So we need to find out what they're devout about and then use those words back to them. The next kind is called a dynast donor. So uh, can you name a couple of... Dynast donors in our country's history, like major philanthropists. <laughs> That's exactly right. So um, there are a couple more that I'd like to hear. So that, that's what I was listening for. So if I remember a time when I was much younger and Bill Gates was the wealthiest man on the planet and he wasn't giving very much money away and the whole fundraising community was kind of cranky. And I heard him say at a conference one time, Okay, so how old were our country's philanthropists when they started giving their money away? They were 70. I'm 30. Shut up and wait. <laughs> but then we saw him turn into a dynast donor overnight. It was literally on a dime. So does anyone remember when that happened in his life? He got married, and his mom, Mary, died, and he had his first kid all within a year or two, and he just like turned into a dynast. And we heard him at a conference say, I want to have the same breadth of impact on world health that Carnegie had on access to information. And that is totally a dynast posture. They want breadth of impact, and they want to leave a legacy. And so there are people on this island who hold that posture. They want to make sure that whatever gift they're giving is going to affect a lot of people and last. And so you're going to have to say certain things to dynast donors. The next kind is called an investor donor. So what do you think they want out of their contribution? Return. Yes, but not to them. So investor donors need you to use the word return, or ROI. And they're going to say, where's the strategic plan? Where's the audit? What are your measurable objectives? What are your deliverables? That's just 
how they think. And if we can't use the words that they're used to, they're not going to play with us. So we have to talk about how this building a playground actually connects people, which makes the whole island safer. Did you know that? That there's actually actuarial evidence that people who go to playgrounds live in safer neighborhoods. Isn't that amazing? Because people know who their neighbors are, and there isn't as much crime. And when people feel more connected, lots of other social benefits ensue. And so it's not just health. It's a sense of connection. Um, it's about, uh, well, I guess there are many angles of the health thing. But so an investor says, you say to an investor, if we invest in these kids while they're little, they will have healthier lifestyles for generations to come, or for decades to come. Can you this too? Are there investor people who respond to those terms who are maybe feel a little guilty that they are hedge fund managers? And yeah. I've never met themselves? one. I've never met one. <laughs> no, I mean one that, f that felt guilty about anything. Yeah. No. <laughs> Can I just forget it? A related question that across my mind in this investor category, like, um, what about the whole notion of, you know, your property value is um, improved mm -hmm. by, by, great park, by having all these mm -hmm. amenities? Yeah, um, I think that's a I good selling point. I don't know if you want, want to be that crass about it, but I do think that that's in the back of a lot of people's minds. Yeah, I would definitely use that. We're investing in the community too. I mean, it's a little different than the communitarian, but you know, one of the one of the things that's in the book is something that Perry Barrett, at the senior planner of the Park District, had said, which is, "This will be the if we can make these changes, it will be the only playground in North Kitsap that's accessible." Oh, right. Uh -huh. So okay. open this year, but it's not technically in North Kitsap because. The way the island lies. Well, that. <laughs> so there, you know, there are things like that. that, that that's yes. kind of that's I, think, I think the fact that we're here is an example of that. Um, I mean, we we fundraised for this, and the idea behind that was that this is something that we're feeding into us, and we as fundraisers mm -hmm. will go out and use this not just for kids at the playground, but for other organizations that we're involved in. Other things that we do. And we pitched that to donors. <laughs> they said yeah. part of the process we're doing is we're, we're, mm -hmm. we're putting together this program. And look at the next kind of donor. <laughs> so they're paying to something that either they benefited from or people they know have benefited from. And you'll have a lot of those because of this playground. And then the last kind is called a socialite donor. Where do you think they like to give? Yeah. In fact, I had one in one of my uh, classes at the university, very wealthy older woman, and she said, any place I can wear my little black dress? Yeah. <laughs> and she said, here's the deal. We want to be in the right place with the right people at the right moment. We want our picture in the paper. We want our name on the website. You know, it's like, that's how we roll. Just get over it. So and so, <laughs> well, here's that. Somebody always says that to me, and I say, yes, you do. They just wear fleece. They still want to be, yeah, the land trust is totally full of them. So, and the art museum, yeah. Performing arts center, yeah. So um, some of the arts and humanities stuff. But I th they are here. They just want to be in a rustic home <laughs> with organic food. They're just, you know, it's a different kind of socialite. But they do want to be in the right place with the right people at the right time. So I think it's kind of fun to sort of suss out among our major donors especially where which words might resonate with them and think about that because there's a I don't think you guys have my website oh my website's on the front page of the handouts and on my website there's a thing called boards on fire resources uh, tab and it has um, one of the things that's on there is the seven donor types and pitches the pitch you would make to each one so he showed up sweaty and he showed up sweaty so I know that those two guys are into health Right? They just don't shower. <laughs> <laughs> no, they both went out of their way to come here on foot. And so I would, use, I would say you're devout about healthful communities. And you want the kids on this island to grow up having that as a value. So. You guys ready to get? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to go back to your handouts while Trish is setting up uh, the food and write down something that you want to remember or act on. Uh, so far.